try to figure out who it is, who it is we're dealing with on the mission field, okay? Because as soon as you get out there and start sharing the gospel, you're going to run into people that have different ideas, different traditions, different uh, philosophies uh, than yourself, and you have to learn to bridge the communication gaps, okay? And so that has been pretty much our goal. Uh, years ago, some probably about 35 years ago, I had gone to a full gospel businessman's breakfast in Fairbanks, Alaska, and um, there was a few dozen guys there that morning that uh, were basically just sharing their testimony of what God was doing in their life, and of course they would invite unsaved businessmen like themselves to uh, be exposed to the gospel is basically what it was all about. We were tricking people into the kingdom. Actually, we were tricking people into a, you know, an opportunity to share with them the kingdom is what it was about. So anyway, uh, I felt that God had spoken to me, that he had called me to address issues that a lot of people were, were running away from. And there are some hard issues. There are hard, difficult, challenging things that we run into as Christians. And it has been Peggy and I's goal to try to sort those out and try to find answers to give to people. Okay? And we've discovered that you have to contend earnestly for the faith. Okay? And that word contend, if you look it up in the Greek, it, it is the word apologia. Hmm? So, uh, to make an apology for somebody, in English we have this idea that to make an apology is to say, I'm sorry, I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. But originally what it meant was, I'm going to stand up and defend my faith in spite of everything that you have to say. Okay? Right. It was like an attorney. Okay, that's what apologetics is all about. Okay? Now, if you're going to do evangelism, it's a good idea to study the realm of apologetics because that is what it's all about, is learning to address the hard issues that you run into. And if you would turn with me in your Bible to the book of Jude, it's just before the book of Revelation, and it starts out in verse 1, Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Hmm? For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand, beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving the people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. Now, you all know the story. Uh, the children of Israel left Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, and then 40 years in the wilderness, they made a lot of mistakes. And a lot of them perished in the wilderness because of those mistakes. And then he goes on to say, And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, who was kept in eternal bonds, under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And then he makes an interesting parallel here. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Yet, in the same manner, these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. Now, that is kind of a picture of what we see in the news today. Huh? Drove by a church uh, on the way here from Bainbridge Island, and there's a big rainbow above the sign of the church saying that they're affirming the LGBTQWXYZ or however many more yeah. letters you want to add to it. They just keep adding letters as the time goes on. Huh? 
Well, it's probably not going to get better, right? Because sin is on the move and the devil is doing what he does. He deceives people. He holds them in bondage. And so that shouldn't be a big surprise. It's, you know, it's just part of the world we live in. Okay? And that's kind of what Jude is addressing here. Okay? Now, some of the things that, that God does with Peggy and I, he puts us in position to expose things that need to be dealt with. And oftentimes we don't even realize how we got in that position to start with. It's not like we go seek it out. I mean, sometimes we do, you know. In evangelism, you go out on the street and you look for opportunity. But oftentimes we have found ourselves in situations that, that we needed to address an issue, but God supernaturally put us in a position to do it. Well, uh, <clears throat> just to give you an idea, Uh, years ago, we lived on Bainbridge Island. A lot of you know that. We lived on, on several different boats, okay? And we had messages on the sails of some of our boats, okay? And uh, there was a time when we were living on a 22-ton on a catch. And we couldn't find moorings for it because they had a bowsprit sticking out the front and a davit with a dinghy hanging off the back. And, and it took up uh, more than a 40-foot slip. And that's kind of the norm for you know, 40 foot yachts is a 40 foot slip. And ours was about, you know, 40, uh, 45 or six or somewhere thereabouts. And so it was hard to find more. So as it, now, now strangely enough, God uses these inconvenient times. So as a result, we, we were anchored out in the harbor on the hook and commuting back and forth to the city dock for a couple of years. Well, in the meantime, we had a banner on the side of our boat that simply said, repent or you're going to hell. <laughs> a little bit in your face, huh? Yeah. And uh, a lot of people, you know, give us a hard time for that. They said, you guys are just so judgmental and you're just blue. That's just not very loving and blah, 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 blah. And there was actually a woman that would paddle by our boat on the way to the city dock. Her and her husband lived on a boat in the harbor. And uh, one day she stopped and she was just disgusted with us. She says, you know, I'm a Christian. And of course, she wasn't going to church and hadn't been for a long time, but she was a Christian, and I think she legitimately was, born again, but she never had a foundation of any kind of scriptural teaching or anything. She knew very little about the Bible. And she says, you know, I'd like for my husband to become a Christian, but he's never going to become a Christian with your approach. Well, to make a, a long story short, I began to go pay him a visit. Great guy, well, well-read guy. Hmm? Uh, him and I kind of hit it off, and next thing you know, I'm baptizing her husband, who would never come to the Lord with our method. <laughs> okay, so God put us in that position right after they came to the Lord. Now, just just to bring this home, today they are on their way to Tijuana on a mission. Okay, so this is the real deal. Now this happened quite a few years ago. Uh, Bainbridge Island, you may not know this, but Bainbridge Island is named after a captain, Captain Bainbridge. And uh, he, he was pretty famous for the Battle of 1812. But backing up to the year 1800, the years leading up to that, uh, American ships were being targeted by Muslim uh, pirates in the Mediterranean, okay, out of Tripoli, okay? And they had actually taken a number of our ships, or, or the crew of our ships, and they were holding these guys as slaves, okay? And in the world of Islam, the slave trade was a big deal. They were charging America several hundred thousand dollars a year uh, as what they call a, a demi tax or a jizya, okay? And what a jizya is, is uh, they would allow us infidels, or in Arabic it's kafirs. If, if you're not a Muslim, you are a kafir. A kafir is what you are. You are an infidel. Yeah, that's not a compliment, okay? And that's an insult, okay? And kafirs need to either have their head cut off if they won't convert, or if they have something that can benefit the world of Islam, then you pay the, the jizya tax to the, uh, in that case, it was the Ottoman Empire. You pay the jizya tax 
to the, uh, the head of the pirate uh, operation there. His name was Mustafa. Mustafa was charging America several hundred thousand dollars a year to allow our ships to not be raided by pirates, okay? So Captain Bainbridge in the year 1800 was sailing to Tripoli to deliver the annual Jizya tax. And when he got there, he found out that Mustafa had raised the raid. He didn't have the money, okay? So what they forced Captain Bainbridge to do was to load his ships up with black slaves that the Muslims had captured and take them to Istanbul. And they said, you ferry in these slaves to Istanbul to the slave market, then we'll forgive you the debt. Okay, that's year 1800. Well, Bainbridge Island doesn't talk about that a little bit. That's politically incorrect. Okay, they have a plaque down there that talks about Battle of 1812, but it says nothing about the year 1800 or 1801. 1801, see, as a result of this, the Americans decided, we're not paying the Jizzy attacks anymore. From now on, we're going to build a navy and we're going to go to war against pirates. And they did. The very next year, uh, Captain Bainbridge took a fleet of six ships and they went to the Mediterranean seeking pirates. And they went to war. And that war lasted for about five years and eventually there was a treaty. And the Yesterday, Peggy and I were out in front of the uh, intersection there above the ferry terminal with this sign. Bainbridge Island, or Captain Bainbridge said no to Islam. And I tell you what, there were some people a little bit shocked by our sign. And then we'd flip it around and we'd say, you're gonna stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And there's of course people backed up there every time the light would change, there'd be a new crowd. And just, you know, God has a sense of humor. <laughs> When we pulled up there, it just so happens that Jehovah's Witnesses had a display set up as well. And there's this elderly couple there with their uh, Watchtower publication material on it. And we just happened to have a sign to accommodate them, the Watchtower. Huh? Now, people would say that's not very Christian. It addresses the Mormons as well. Okay, but you know, you must be born again, the Bible says. Huh? Okay, all right, well, these folks here are not born again. And not only are they not born again, their religion attacks our religion, our Jesus Christ, okay? And so that's a problem. Like I just read in Jude, we have to defend the historical message of the gospel. Okay, so that's what we're doing. Okay, now, uh, you know, this is like killing three birds with one stone here. So we're, we're offending a lot of people by standing out there with this. But we offended a gal with a sign on the side of our boat, and those folks have been hardcore Christians ever since I offended them because they came to the Lord and are on the mission field today in Tijuana. Okay? So praise the Lord for that. Okay, so as we're, as we're standing out there with our signs, and we've got, we got several different ones. There's a gal, there's a bar across the street, right? And everybody's sitting, it's a nice sunny day, and everybody's sitting outside, they're drinking beer and wine, whoever, you know, whatever. And uh, of course, you know, we're showing them the signs and flipping around. So we got a camera set up on a, on a, a tripod to kind of record a lot of this stuff. Because sometimes people come up and they, they give you a hard time. And I, I want to make sure that I have, have it on tape in case they come up and punch you in the face or something. Yeah. And, and I, I've been threatened a few times. We were out in front of a, uh, Jehovah's Witness convention one time and this guy came up and I knew he was going to plug me. I, just, I see he was trembling. He was so mad and he walked up and I just have, have a camera hanging around my neck and I turned it on I said, go ahead pal, take your best shot because you're on tape and you're going to jail for it. And he calmed right down and we had a pretty good chat there for a little while. So sometimes it's good to have a camera on the ready. Okay, well in 2 Corinthians uh, I'm going to be reading out of chapter 5. It says, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. 
Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Now that's our motivation, okay? We believe in God's judgment. I not only believe in hell, I believe God judges us on the physical plane today. You know, I've seen it. I've seen people that have, that have come against us and their lives have gone down the toilet. I mean, seriously. Uh, I could tell you quite a few stories. And, and it normally doesn't happen like overnight, but he watched uh, over a period of few years and some things begin to happen. And he, I mean, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, right? And, and that's what persuades us. Is, you know, people may come against us, and I understand, you know, they're being motivated by the spirit of Antichrist, and you have to look beyond the person and understand that, that that's what's going on, because oftentimes the stuff that comes out of their mouth is not really them, it's something else, okay? And if you look through the Gospels, and especially in the book of Mark, you will see that about a third of the ministry of Jesus Christ was casting out demons. Huh? I mean, from the very beginning, when the Holy Spirit came on Jesus, right away, you know, he's led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit, and who harasses him? The devil. So you want to get filled with the Holy Spirit? Guess what's coming next? Yeah. Uh, the broad street bully is going to come and try to talk you out of your faith. Okay? That's what happens. And if you get out and start doing evangelism publicly, guess who's going to come and try to talk you out of it? We had a gal uh, uh, stop by yesterday, and she says, this is just disgusting. And she says, you know, you guys ought to be ashamed of yourself. And she went on and on and on and on. And uh, I said, well, praise God, you're entitled to your opinion. This is America, after all. You know? But also, another gal came across the street, come to find out she was, of one of the people on the list here. She was from the LDS Church, the Mormon Church. And she's, she didn't give it away right, right away. She didn't tell us this morning. But, you know, if you've been around, you know their language, you know, all the different paraphrases they use. And uh, it was right away we figured out that she was a Mormon. So we began to kind of address the Mormon problem. Uh, and, of course, it wasn't long before you know, she spilled the beans. She said she was a Mormon. I said, well, just out of curiosity, how Mormon have you been a Mormon? And she says, well, my, Mor my, my parents were raised, uh, they, they were Lutherans, and they had an issue with the Trinity. Hmm? And they couldn't understand how this whole Trinity thing happens. So as a result, the Mormons came along and talked them right out of it. Okay? Now, the reason a lot of people end up in cults is because the church is not doing its job. You know, the, you, you've heard you've heard the analogy: those that don't learn from history, they're destined to repeat it. Okay. Well, the Old Testament is the history of how God deals with His people, and if you don't read the Old Testament, you're not going to understand how God deals with His people. Okay. And you look through the Old Testament, you'll see that. Certain leaders, patriarchs, kings did certain things, and the children of Israel did certain things when they left Egypt, and you see the result. Okay? So we need to learn from history. Learn a little history about Captain Bainbridge is a good thing because, see, you can use that to talk to people who live on Bainbridge because 99% of them don't have any idea what that's about, see? And they're going to say, well, you know, all religions believe the same thing. Really? I, I don't know of any other Christian churches that are raiding our ships and selling our, our crews into slavery. Huh? So, the reality is, really, religions are not all the same. I mean, we drove by a church down here that claims to be a Christian church. It's got a big rainbow uh, above their sign. Okay? So do we believe the same thing? No. Probably not. No. Hmm? Because there's a problem there. Okay? But nobody wants to talk about it because, of course... If you won't make a cake for a gay person's wedding, guess who comes after you? The ACLU, and they want to see your pants off, okay? But you have to realize that you need to stand up to that stuff. When we lived on Bainbridge Island, we got into a legal battle over that very issue, and it took quite a while to get it dealt with, but we ended up having to sue the city over that. They lost, and we won. And it cost them $10,000 to pick up the fee of our attorneys, okay? And we didn't, we didn't get anything personally out of it at all, 
but they had to change their, their laws and they had to admit that they screwed up. They had two police officers come down there and try to give us a hard time saying that we couldn't, we couldn't hold a sign on Bainbridge Island. And they said, I don't know if I had a permit. And I said, well, yeah, I do, as a matter of fact. I'm a U.S. citizen, I have First Amendment rights, so yes, I have a permit. And I said, oh, no, no, on Bainbridge Island, you have to have a permit from the city. I said, okay, so we went down to the city hall and talked to the, the, the clerk there, and he showed me the, uh, the law. Well, what they were trying to impose on us was a parade ordinance, which meant I had to run it by city hall, I had to pay a fee, I had to have a police escort that I had to pay for. See, but see, this is the tricks that they play, okay? Well, since we've been over on the other side, the Lord put us in a position in the public schools there. We had no idea what we were getting into in this little town of, you know, 4,000 people or so. Uh, the Lord opened the door for my wife Peggy to work as a librarian in the elementary school. Next thing you know, uh, she sees that the head librarian over the whole district his, she's the one that orders the books for the kids, right? Next thing you know, she's ordering all these gay-friendly books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so Peggy uh, brings them home and so we could all look at them and she goes, what do you think we're gonna do? I said, well, tell you what, let's just do a, a video, book review of these books and we'll put it up on public television <laughs> and the Yakima station and we'll just expose this whole thing for what it is, okay? And we did, and spam hit the fan, <laughs> okay? But, see, this is what we are to do as Christians. We are the salt of the earth. And what did Jesus say? If the salt loses its savor, it's good for what? Nothing. Nothing but to be trampled underfoot by men, okay? So, if you wanna get trampled, more power to you. I'm not going there. I'm gonna stand up against it, okay? Well, then, fast forward a couple of years, at that point, they wanted to get rid of Peggy. You know, they wanted to get her out of the library. Okay, they were polite to her and everything. She still had her job. But uh, the leadership was wanting her to go away because she was presenting problems for them, political problems. So anyway, as they begin to put pressure on her, uh, I'm working, I got a job driving school bus. Okay, and I've been remodeling our house, and so in between routes, I'd work on the house, and then in the mornings, I'd ride school bus. And uh, then I had this idea, we had this little red S10 pickup truck, and I had this idea that was in my head for, for a few weeks that it'd be great if I had a sign, a big sign in the back of the truck that I could, you know, have to address the cults and, and the gospel and stuff. And then out of the, out of the blue, this, this older gentleman at this church we were attending a retired barber, he says, you know, I got to thinking about this, you know, I, you could probably use this sign that I used to have for my business. He says, you know, you could put anything you want on it, but he says, it's, it's got a great metal framework, you could do whatever you want with it. And I'm like, praise God, somebody just give me this sign. So I painted on the sign this message, basically this message right here, and then on the bottom I put Jesus is Lord. On the flip side, I wrote, God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. <laughs> and people find that very offensive. Yeah. Okay, and mm -hmm. of course, the superintendent, uh, immediately he began to get flack because I would drive it to work and park it across the street from the bus garage. <laughs> and the elementary school that the buses have to go to directly is only a half a block away. And it isn't long before uh, the superintendent, a Jewish fellow, uh, is getting all kinds of nasty calls about us bigoted Christians. The guy with the sign, that, that guy. So one day he calls me in, he says, uh, do you have a little red truck? I said, I do. He says, does it have a sign on the back of it? I said, it does. He says, you know, legally there's not anything I can do about the sign of your truck because we can't have laws that control bumper stickers and everything else that people write in their cars. But he says, I'm getting so much flack from the people in this district because of your sign on your truck. He says, would you just don't drive it on school property? Try to keep me out of the loop. Hmm? I said, no problem. Of course, I knew that wasn't gonna solve the problem because they were, people, they were coming after us big time. 
So it isn't long before there's a, a woman and a little boy with picket signs out in front of the bus garage picketing me. <laughs> huh? And my truck. Well, next thing you know, it's in the news. It's on television. She's being interviewed, and she put together a special Facebook page dedicated to us, <laughs> which is fine with me. We got more publicity than we could have bragged for, you know, on the spot. And then they had this immigration walkout day. Remember that a couple years ago? What it was was uh, the immigrants decided they would use their kids to manipulate public policy. And what they did was all the immigrants, uh, <clears throat> one day they decided they would not either go to work or the kids would not go to school. Okay, so Peggy working in the library, I'm driving the school bus, and about a third of the kids didn't show up at school. We thought, praise God, that's great. They had to do it every day. You know, it made it a lot easier for us because most of the time the classes are overflowing. You know, you got all kinds of problems on the school bus. No, 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 no. You know, and uh, so Peggy made the comment on Facebook that just that, you know, immigration walkout, great. You know, made it a lot easier for us. They had to do it every day. Next thing you know, we're getting death threats from Mexico City. We had the police parking down the street from our house for about a week. Towards the end of this two-year period, uh, Peggy, last November, went to work and noticed what happened was they took her out of the library and then the, print, the uh, superintendent said that he did it to protect, to separate her from kids. And he said that on television, okay? So that left the audience thinking that she's some kind of pervert, maybe, you know? And so, defend your character. <clears throat> so, guess what happens? We look outside one day, and there's a television crew outside of our house. And next thing you know, this guy knocks on the door. He says, are you Peggy Brown? And Peggy says, yeah. He says, uh, I heard about what's going on with your Facebook page and the immigrants, and could I interview you? So next thing you know, Peggy's on national news, on television. So, they take her out of the library, they put her in this fake job for nearly two years where she does nothing but get paid and read books. And it worked for me. You know, it worked for her. Okay. But, it, you know, but the plot even thickens. This is an office where the head person of the office is a Wiccan, that's a witch, full-blown paper-carrying Wiccan, okay? The uh, translator, Hispanic young guy for the district, happens to be homosexual. Oh, the plot thickens, we're not done yet. Well, the, the head of the office just happens to perform the marriage ceremony for this homosexual guy when he marries his significant other boyfriend. Now this is, I'm not making this stuff up. And then the other two girls that she works with happen to be members of the LDS Church. Don't call us Mormons, they recently have come up with. Now, they don't like the term Mormon, right? So, did God put her specifically in that spot? Well, it sure looks like it. But it was a little tense for her for a couple years, you know? But uh, then, I mean, this is just amazing how God works. Then, back in November, she makes, uh, goes to work and finds out that her check hasn't been deposited uh, in our account. So she calls across the street to district office to find out what's going on. And uh, the secretary says, well, you know, I'm just doing my job, uh, but I was told to withhold your check this month. Well, that's kind of illegal, you know? <laughs> so so uh, Peggy's a little disturbed. Is this for real? You know, I, I can't believe this is actually happening because this is a lawsuit in the making. And so a little bit later she contacts the superintendent, the guy that's head of finance, and uh, they don't, she sends a text message and a voice message, and they don't even bother to contact her. So a couple hours go by. She calls me at home. She tells me what's going on. She goes, what do you think we ought to do? I said, okay, <clears throat> send an email and a text message to all the members of the school board, along with superintendent and the director of finance. Tell them that if you don't have your check by the end of the day, we're gonna be out in front of your office tomorrow with a, with a television crew and a bunch of picket signs. And within five minutes, you got a check. <laughs> so that's what you're dealing with. You know, people that win through intimidation, okay? And we as Christians should not be intimidated. 
we should see it as a faith venture huh? something to pray through okay and it's tense it is definitely tense okay and you learn to pray you learn to pray about things you never dreamed of praying before but i tell you what god is your vindication we have seen god vindicate us so many times it is just amazing well <clears throat> just another little detail and we found out shortly after that that the guy that's the head of finances there just happens to be a member of the LDS church. So what did we do? We found out what church he goes to, and the next Sunday, we drove to his church with some picket signs and a camera set up on a tripod, kind of like this one here. And we picked it out in front of his church. Now, this sounds kind of crazy, maybe, that we do some of the things that we do. But Paul, where I was just reading, he says, we are not again committing ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us that you may have an answer for those who take pride in appearance, not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God, and if we are of sound mind, it is for you. Now we can do crazy things for God, and oftentimes the things that God has led us to do seem to be pretty crazy. And oftentimes you don't see the positive fruit of it right then, but later on the, down the road, just like Jesus' disciples, oftentimes they would look back at things that he said to them or things that he did, and they would say, ah, oh, now we get it, okay? And that's the way it is, being led by the Holy Spirit. Oftentimes you don't understand what the Holy Spirit's telling you to do at the time, but if you're faithful and prayerful, he will lead you to do things that will bear positive fruit. And it's not because you're so smart it's not because I'm a great preacher or, or very articulate. I mean, Apostle Paul him, himself, you know, and, and Moses, right? He, he didn't claim to be a great orator, you know? He even wanted to have Aaron come and speak for him because uh, he wasn't a very good speaker. It doesn't have any anything to do with how articulate we are, you know? God can use anybody. I mean, if, I mean after all, he spoke through a donkey in the Old Testament. Huh? So he might be able to use us, you know? I mean, really. And, and Jesus himself said, hey, if everybody keeps quiet, guess what? The stones might cry out. So God has a plan, and we need to pray, what is the plan? I want to be a part of it, okay? In Ephesians, it says there are, <clears throat> there are different types of ministries. There's apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, okay? I've been a pastor before, but it's really not my cup of tea, you know? Just hearing people's problems the same day over and over and over and over. You know, as an evangelist, my idea is get over it and get moving. You know, but as a pastor, you have to put up with people, let them grow up. You have to watch them make mistakes that you know are going to be painful, and you're just going, oh man, this is going to be painful for them. And I warned them, but they didn't listen. That's a pastor's job. As an evangelist's job is, you go out, you just Tell the message, confront the situation, and you just say, okay, God, did my part, now it's your job. You know, it's not my job to please people. It's my job to please God, okay? And if I've pleased God and offended all of humanity, that's fine with me, okay? Because he's the one that takes care of me. He's my comforter. He meets all my physical and financial needs miraculous it is incredible i mean we have been and i'm sure a lot of you have been in situations like this here we've had out of the blue we've had people just give us money that didn't know us from adam you know one time we were in lake havasu and we were picketing out in front of the mormon church we were on our way to salt lake city for the olympics and we thought well we got some time to kill or redeem and we were staying with some friends and it was Sunday and they weren't going to church and we thought, well, I'm, I'm going to stay home with them. So we thought, well, let's take our signs, which we'd already had ready for Salt Lake, and let's go pick up the Mormon church. That's so, we did, right? And so we're out there with our picket signs and, and next thing you know, some of the Mormons come out and they were just furious with us because it was a real special day for them because this guy named Young, what's his first name? The Bastard, the ball Steve. player. Steve Young, yeah. Steve Young was there. He was a famous ball player, you know, and I don't, I don't know anything about sports, so it didn't mean a thing to me. 
But they came up and were so upset. Did you know that Steve Young is here today? You guys are doing this? I said, well, praise God. He needs to hear what we got, apparently. You know? <laughs> well, and then it isn't long before there's a lady across the street. She was all upset, and she came out, and she wanted us to move our vehicle because it was too close to her house. And she, you know. <clears throat> so we moved the vehicle, and, and we went back to our little job, picketing and passing out <laughs> literature and stuff. And, Next thing you know, this pastor shows up. And quite often when you're doing this and a pastor shows up, it's not a good thing. Uh, and sometimes the pastors, I, we've been raked over the coals by pastors saying, this is not loving, this brings reproach on the gospel, and blah, blah, blah. You know, well, this guy shows up and he says, praise God, you know. We've been praying for the Mormons, and maybe you're an answer to our prayers. Like, well, this is unusual. Okay, he's a Calvary Chapel pastor. And the next thing you know, he invites us to lunch, and he says, uh, stop by the church. I want, I want to give you a book, I'm going to Greg, and we're traveling. Uh, this is what I need is another book. You know, we got plenty of books. i got a huge library. So he goes, oh, yeah, okay. So we stop by there, and he comes out and gives me this book, and then with the book, he gives me a check for I don't know, 300, 350 bucks or something. He says, we just want to <laughs> encourage you guys for what you're doing, you know, and we did not expect that. Yes. And, and we could tell you just dozens of stories like that. It's, you know, we just want to do what God has called us to do. And we encourage you to be a little more bold. Don't be afraid to do what God's called you to do. And, you know, you're not me. We're, we all have different personalities, different ways of doing things. But whatever it is that God's called you to do, do it. Nice. Mark here, he's an accountant. I, I can't even think like he does, you know. When, when I listen to him rattle on these IRS rules and stuff, I'm going, how does a brain work like that? I, I just, it doesn't work for me. I, I'm not an administrator, right? That kind of stuff just doesn't work. I'm a, one of those artsy kind of guys, you know? Yeah. And spontaneous, evangelistic kind of guys. More of a, well, sometimes you get the, the ministry of uh, evangelism and prophetic gifts mixed up because they're very similar. You know, when God tells you to go someplace as an evangelist, that's very similar to what God might tell a prophet to do. And so sometimes within the church, there's a little confusion about those particular gifts. So we've, we've been accused of all kinds of things, but I'm going to go ahead and close in prayer. And uh, if anybody has any prayers, or, we have a whole pile of videos on the back table back there that address a lot of the things that we run into. There, we, we have a, a YouTube program which has several hundred videos We've addressed everything from Islam to Mormonism, Unitarianism, the LGBTQ, the, you name it, Baha'ism. We've locked horns with Muslims all over the place in the Tri-Cities and San Diego and the, the, the ones over here in Redmond, across from Seattle. And uh, so we've got videos that address that. And uh, so, you know, if there's anything back there you want to take more power to you, We've got a blog site, which I write articles on. There's, I don't know, there's a couple hundred articles on our blog site. And uh, then uh, they blocked me out of Facebook uh, a couple of years ago, so I had to get a different Facebook account. For a while, I was using Peggy's. That's how she got in trouble, because the school <laughs> district thought that she was doing this during her work time. And it was actually me, see? <laughs> and so, but now we're, we've uploaded a lot of our stuff to something called... Uh, uh, bit shoot and it's similar to YouTube except for it's uh, it's not so politically correct uh, on YouTube <coughs> there's certain things that you address they will they will uh, limit your audience they will actually block certain parts of your audience and then on Facebook they do the same thing they'll put you in Facebook jail I've been in Facebook jail so many times I'm a you know <laughs> habitual offender you know hey, but that's okay uh, so Peggy and I now we have two separate Facebook book accounts so that I don't offend her crowd too much and she doesn't use mine so uh, then we use another uh, video program called Vimeo if you're familiar with that one we've got a whole bunch of videos on Vimeo and that's uh, now most of these things are they're free platforms it doesn't cost you anything the only thing that costs you is the time to actually make the videos so these are just different ways you can reach people uh, through these different types of internet uh, platforms, we reach people all over the world. I have people, it's amazing how many Christians there are in Pakistan. You know, you wouldn't think it's a Muslim country. There are a lot of Christians in Pakistan. I have people that friend me all the time, you know, on MeWe and Facebook from Pakistan, you know. 
And uh, you know, Pakistan's a Muslim country, and over there, you know, they get a lot of flack. I mean, they get killed often, you know, for for being a Christian. And then here, uh, a year or so ago, I got a contact from a, a Hindu guy, uh, a Janus, a Jan, Janism, it's an offshoot of Hinduism. Uh, a guy in India, he's in Western India, a very Muslim strong part of India, and he contacted me, and. Uh, we got to talking over a period of a few days, and the next thing you know, he wanted to know uh, how he could get a Bible. And I said, well, you contacted the right person. And he already had a Bible, but I think it was a King James. He had no commentary or concordance or anything. And King James was, I mean, it's his second language in English, so he doesn't speak good English to start with, and then all of a sudden he's got a King James Bible. So, poor, poor guy. So I ended up, I told him, I'll tell you what, I have a great study Bible I will send you. It's in modern English, pretty easy uh, to read, and I'll send that to you. And, and right away he got afraid. He says, how do I know you're not a Muslim? You're going to send me a bomb. So this is what you're dealing with, see? And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll take a picture of me holding up the Bible so that you know I'm not a Muslim. And I did, I took a picture, held up the Bible, said, this is me, <laughs> you know. And I sent him this picture. And that he was so thankful that uh, I wasn't a Muslim. And I told him, look, I'm in America, pal. And it cost me 50 bucks to ship the Bible to him. Yeah. It took about, it, it took about uh, I think it was about six weeks or something for him to finally get it. And after about three or four weeks, he wrote me and he was really afraid. He says, I thought you were sending me a Bible. And I said, well, I did, uh, you know, a month ago. He says, well, why isn't it here? And I said, I don't know, I don't control the mail, man. You know, but he got very afraid because he thought again, well, maybe you lied to me. See, and so he was, I said, no, I didn't lie to you, mate. I, I'm praying for you, and you're going to get the Bible. And he finally got it, and he was so happy, and, and I still have a report of this guy to this day on the Internet, see. So you just never know. Use whatever way you can to reach people, and just do your best, and God will bless it. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God. We, we praise you. We thank you for all that you do. We thank you for the way that you use us, and Lord, we do have different abilities, different personalities. Uh, we all have different places in society that we live and function in, and we can all reach different people, but it's for the same cause. And Lord, help us not to preach our church or preach our tradition, but preach Jesus Christ, because he's the one that makes a difference. And we just give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.